Hi, this is the Bet Central podcast. Let's make some profit. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 63rd episode of Zach Lowy's European Football Show. I'm here today with Juan Buxade, football commentator who joins us from Monterrey, Mexico. Juan, how are you doing? Everything good. Everything good in the north of Mexico. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And sorry in advance because I'm the only non-native English speaker. So if I made mistakes, my English is kind of rusty. You know, I watch movies in English. I listen to the games in English, but I never speak in English on my daily basis. So if I'm wrong, yeah. just let me know. It's not going to be a problem. No for apologies me. accepted. <laughs> no, I, um, <laughs> but I'm sure you're going to do great. Also delighted to have one of my favorite scouts on Twitter, Ben Mattinson, uh, joining us from Nottingham, England. Ben, how are you today? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Um, happy to be here with both of you talking about this. And I'll be honest, English is my only language. So the fact that you're in a second language is more impressive. <laughs> I'm working on it, though. I'm working slowly. <laughs> Guys, uh, so much to discuss today. Obviously, we're going to hear who is the new Ballon d'Or winner. In a few hours, a few minutes, we'll see. But um, spoiler alert: it's not Vinny. It's not. He's not Vinny. Probably Bini. not going to be Vinny. I, I think it'll be one of the biggest, uh, you know, three sixties, if, if biggest one eighties, if Vinny ends up winning it. But uh, for now, at least, the biggest news of the day is none other than Eric Ten Hag being sacked as uh, Manchester United manager. He said as at his presentation. You know, Liverpool and Manchester City, they play great football. I admire them, uh, but all eras come to an end. And as it seems, uh, the Ten Hag era has come to an end. They're going to transition to an interim coach, another Dutchman, Ruud van Nistelrooy. Um, but overall, it, it seemed like it was clearly an untenable situation. It seemed like it was only going to be a matter of time before they did sack him. Ben, what's your take on the situation? How much blame... Can Ten Hag hold for uh, what's going on with United right now? Yeah, uh, quite a bit. But at the same time, I think a lot was has gone wrong from the beginning when he came in. I think at Ajax's t- talent ID was never... That wasn't him. It was um, Overmars they was working with. That was in terms of the scouting. And his was more the coaching side. And I think it showed by a lot of the signings that were made where they were signing players that he just you know, managed before. And it didn't look like there was a real identity that they were building towards. Um, and so it's just some of the decision-making from top to bottom has been all over the place. And I think there's parts of his personality, because I hadn't watched Ajax week in, week out before. And I, so I didn't see all his press conferences, but there's parts where I just, as it went along, I think you can learn a lot from a manager by how they respond to adversity. And a lot of the questioning he got he didn't respond very well to that, um, which I think shows he's not the guy you want long term. From an Arsenal fan's point of view, this is a sad day. Because <laughs> they, got, they got rid of him. They got rid of a manager that I love the fact that I was watching them get beat 4 0 by Brentford or, you know, but yeah. I think this is the best thing for them as a club. Um, and it'll be interesting to see who comes in next. Because this is where, from the owner's point of view, they can really show, you know, are they going to change their, um, you know, their future or not? Yeah. No, it, it's, it's a sad day for a lot of people in England, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think that Pep is crying. Maybe Arne is lot too. You know, for me, it was like a, this uh, move from Pep Guardiola. It was, it's a joke, but they said that he wanted Man United to win the FA Cup yeah. to keep him hot. Now the spell is broken and Ten Hag is leaving. And well, you said uh, Ruth van Nistelrooy is going to be the coach, but there are a lot of uh, people saying that maybe Xavi could jump in. Right. Yeah, I think that um, it's a big test for the Ineos management. I, I do think that they made a big mistake keeping Ten Hag this summer. Let's face it, if Haji Wright was like a centimeter offside, we would be talking about one of the greatest collapses in FA Cup history. How Manchester United blew a two-goal lead to Coventry City, the championship side. Uh, and, and yeah, but of course he wasn't. And uh, at Manchester United, they end up winning the FA Cup. Trophies talk, and it spoke more than the actual results and performances that were happening. 
Um, but ultimately, this, in my opinion, this decision probably comes five months too late. Uh, gotta think that this next season is a write-off, and yeah, it's happened quite a lot in the post-Sir Alex era, right? You know, Jose Mourinho getting sacked midway through the season. It happened to old Gunnar Solskjaer as well. It happened to a lot of coaches. Um, so, you know, I can't help but think that they're going to have a tough time, you know, getting the services of a top quality manager, someone like Ruben Amorim, Sebastian Honus, uh, someone who's going to, you know, come in in the middle of a season, right? Obviously, there are some free agents like Xabi, as you mentioned, Juan, but uh, yeah, not a great season, not a great start of the season for Manchester United, but biggest question is, who do they go for, right? They've gone with you know, experienced, proven winners, guys like Van Gaal and Mourinho. They've gone with uh, project managers like Ten Hag. Wh who are they going to land on now? But um, anyways, we'll, we'll get back to the Premier League in a little bit. I want to start uh, this discussion by going over the action in Germany. Uh, whilst Wolfsburg and St. Pauli shared the spoils in a goalless encounter, Mainz took the lead in the 55th minute via an own goal, only to cough up the equalizer moments later in a 1-1 draw against Gladbach. For the second time this week, Borussia Dortmund opened the scoring only to succumb to a defeat, with Alexis Podmaris's brace seeing Augsburg pull off the upset of the weekend and win 2-1 at home against BVB. Heidenheim were held to a 0-0 stalemate against Hoffenheim, whilst Bayern Munich took care of business by demolishing Bochum 5-0. Another team that bounced back from a midweek Champions League defeat was RB Leipzig, who erased an early deficit and beat Freiburg 3-1 via second-half goals from Willy Orban, Luchara Virchoida, and Lois Openda. After pulling off a shock victory at Juventus midweek, Stuttgart picked up their first Bundesliga win in over a month after edging Holstein Kiel 2-1, a match that would see both sides finish it with 10 men, whilst Eintracht Frankfurt were held to a 1-1 draw at Union Berlin. Bayer Leverkusen took an early lead via Victor Boniface, only to concede in the 74th minute to Werder Bremen's Marvin Deutsch. Leverkusen responded immediately after and looked headed for a win until the 90th minute when Romano Schmid equalized for Werder. That's now three draws in four for the defending champions. Juan, it's never going to be easy following in the footsteps of last season's domestic double, but it's clear that Leverkusen are struggling to find momentum right now they sit third in the table five pi five points behind Bayern and Leipzig just what needs to change right now for Xabi Alonso's side to get back on track you know I was commentating uh, the game of Champions League against uh, Brest with uh, Leverkusen and I was talking with uh, this uh, media genius in Spanish Diego Balado and we agreed on maybe this is the last dance for Xabi Alonso plenty of teams in Europe with want him as a coach. You know, he's amazing. The last season was incredible for him. And, you know, it's something funny that they lost the, the last game against Atalanta 3-0. But, you know, it was uh, quite interesting that against Brest, they rested a lot of players. And including uh, Boniface, uh, he had this uh, accident and he didn't travel to Brest. And it was a draw, but it was a draw also in the Bundesliga, but I think that it was quite unfortunately because they were winning and they uh, uh, they had this opportunity while they were winning to one of uh, Bertz that he hit the post at the 83rd minute and at the, la at the end of the game, you know, it's maybe karma. They scored so many goals at the last minute uh, last season and they, they conceded a goal uh, the United minute, and now, as you said, they are not uh, losing so many games. They lost just one uh, the season, but they are drawing a lot of matches. Yeah, one hundred percent. Got to uh, start arresting that slide and getting back to winning ways. Uh, let's switch gears now to the action in Italy. No goalless draws over there, and a lot of high-scoring shootouts. Torino edged Como 1 0 thanks to a 75th minute goal from substitute Alio and Jay, whilst Parma fell behind via an own goal only for Gabriel Charpentier to equalize in the 80th minute and secure a draw. Atalanta demolished Hellas Verona 6 1 via goals from Martin Durun and Charles de Catelar, as well as braces from Almolo Lukman and Matteo Retegi. Retegi is the third player in Europe's top five leagues to reach the 10 goal mark 
after Erling Holland and Robert Lewandowski. As for Lazio, they made it four home wins on the bounce after beating Genoa 3-0 thanks to goals from Matias Vecino and Tijani Noslin, both of which were assisted by Nuno Tavares, as well as a goal from the ageless Pedro Rodriguez. That's now seven assists for Tavares. No other player uh, has more than four in Serie A. Ben, Tavares didn't quite ma- manage to make a lasting impression in his first two loan spells at Marseille and Nottingham Forest. He didn't quite make uh, an impression at Arsenal either. Could third time be the charm for the Arsenal loan again? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? How um, he's he's done this on his uh, when he was at Marseille as well, where he just exploded at the beginning, and then it was a I think it was a loan that had an option to buy. Um, and they were at that point. It was like, all right, he's off. They're gonna buy him. And from an Arsenal point of view, they're like, can we just just get rid of him? You know. And then his form just fell off. And there was a one game in particular. I remember where it was like on the the photo of it on Sofa Score went viral because it had a sub on, a red card, and a goal all on his thing. And I was like, that just sums up. <laughs> Nuno, you know, he's one of those types of players where you don't know what you're going to get. It's he's so unpredictable, chaotic. But as an athlete and his ability, he's like he's very both footed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's actually his ability in the final third is like excellent. And he's definitely not he's not a defensive fullback at all. Um, so in his system where he they can use that more, um, which is why Marseille initially as a wing back he did really well there. So. It's interesting. I think he's he's got a a decent future, but the the mental side um, and kind of is not quite having the ability to like he needs to be a maverick to get the best out of him. And I think from an Arsenal point of view, we don't they didn't want that type of per, um, he hadn't seen enough progression in that area. So it um, I hope from his point of view you can. Turn it around, but it's interesting seeing him and Gwendozi at Lazio both doing really good, and um, always knowing that they were going to be top players and finding the place to be that now. Yeah, I found the game that you're talking about, Ben uh, Nuno Tavares opening the scoring after halftime against Montpellier. Maxime Esteve doubled it, and then uh, Tavares got a yellow card in the 87th minute. It was upgraded to red. And uh, Marseille end up winning 2-1. Yeah, he is somebody who you never really know what you're going to get. But here's hoping that he can uh, settle down and, and find a permanent home with the Bianco Celeste. The really promising start for the Portuguese wingback. Uh, elsewhere in Serie A, Keenan Davis scored his first goal since May 26th. Uh, when he scored on the final day against Frosinone to keep uh, his team up and relegate Frosinone with goals from him and Lorenzo Luca seeing Udinese beat Cagliari 2-0. Parma shared the spoils in a 1-1 draw at Empoli, whilst Monza and Venezia scored two goals apiece in their stalemate. As for Napoli, they secured a second straight 1-0 victory thanks to a late winner from captain Giovanni Di Lorenzo. They have moved four points clear of Inter and five clear of Juventus atop the Serie A standings. As for Fiorentina, they climbed to fourth in the table after demolishing Roma 5-1. That's now 15 goals in their last three matches for La Viola. The I Jer- studied in Florence, so I love <laughs> Viola. I studied there because I wanted to see the team of Gabriele Omar Batistuta. So, mm. Forza Viola. Legend, Batigol, of course. Uh, the Derby d'Italia lived up to its billing with... Piotr Zielinski opening the scoring after a quarter hour from the penalty spot, only for Juventus to score twice in quick succession via Dusan Vlaovic and Timothy Wea. Inter would respond with two quick-fire goals of their own from Henrik Mikitarian and Zielinski and double the lead after halftime via Denzel Dumfries. Thiago Mota was in need of an answer. He turned to Kenan Gildiz, who rewarded Mota's trust with a brace out off the bench in a 4-4 draw, first time that... Inter have conceded four goals in Serie A since 2020. Juan, Juve sco- sold a lot of promising youngsters this summer, like Matias Sula and Dean Huizen. They kept hold of one really exciting prospect in Kenan Gildiz. At 19 years old, just how big of a talent are we talking with him? 
You know, I don't know how big is him, but I think that the confidence that Thiago Mota has on him is huge. You know, he also got rid of one guy that I really like, like Chiesa, that he said, he doesn't have a place on, his, on my team anymore. And Gildish respond with a two goal. It was an amazing game. It was a thriller. It was so no Serie A, you know, it's like not the kind of game that we are used to watch at Serie A, but it was really good. And this guy has a great story, you know. He plays for Turkey, but he is uh, he was born in Germany, and he was recruited by Bayern Munich while he was seven years old. And he was uh, offered a renovation, but they wanted to keep him with the youngsters. So he said, I'm not going to sign anything. I want to go to somewhere that I could play at the first team. Dortmund asked, asked for him. Barcelona called him, but Juventus was the one that caught his high. And, you know, Thiago Mota really trusted him. He gave him the number 10 jersey, and that means a lot. So yeah. two goals, and he was a great, great game in Serie A. Yeah, Ben, I know that whenever there's a youngster on the rise, you're usually on top of him, like white on rice. You know, you, you deal with players who are, okay, decent prospects. You deal with players who are maybe some of the best prospects of their generation. Where do you classify Yildiz? I mean, what do you think his ceiling is? Yeah, I'm very high for me. I think the thing I like with him and uh, you've got him and Odegule where for Turkey, you can see yeah. them carrying a nation. You, you get sometimes if you think of um, not just like smaller nations, but ones where they're the clear star mm. and they seem to shine on yeah. that pressure. Um, and they're those types of players. And I can see him doing that for Juventus as well. You know, there's already... You get this all the time, and you were early on. They get comparisons with uh, a legend, and he's already getting compared with Del Piero. Like it's a bit calm down, but um, but in terms of his a profile, he's it, th there's so much intelligence to his game because when he was at youth levels, when I first like came across him uh, for the Juve um, Pr Primavera team, and sometimes he'd even play as a striker. And as a striker, he's more of like a link-up player. He'd drop deep, he'd bring other players into it, and his finishing really stood out there. But it's actually his intelligence, which is why you're now seeing someone like Motta, who last season obviously had players like Zerski and Calafiori and these, these guys that really thrived and developed their kind of game intuition and how quickly they can react to different scenarios and bring other players into play. So you're now seeing someone who's going to get the best out of him because he can play as a 10, he can play on the left um, and find the spaces, but he's got that killer instinct as well. And yeah. I, I, for me, I think he'll be one of the top attackers of definitely of his generation, but in the future, it, it depends where with a ceiling for a player, depends mm. where he goes, if he stays there. I'd quite like him to just stay at Juve and just you know become the main guy there. I can see that happening though. Yeah, and I mean, look, there are few bigger honors uh, than getting that number 10 shirt if you're a Juventus player, right? We're talking about Michel Platini, Alessandro Del Piero, Paolo Dybala, Paul Pogba, Roberto Baggio, Carlos Tevez, some world-class players. We're talking about a kid, Yildiz, who this time last year was playing for Juventus' reserve side, and now he's literally scoring a brace against the champions. So this is a very special talent and uh yeah like you mentioned ben you got him and guler kind of leading the charge for this turkey side that's in transition bit similar to what we're seeing with georgia right with kwicha korachkelia and georgia's yeah. nikal Tads. um really exciting to see how those two shape up and form that synergy together guys let's move on now to the action in spain uh only two matches in la liga saw both teams find the back of the net Bierno bari Broke the deadlock early on, only for Mamadou Silla to equalize from the penalty spot for Valladolid. Rayose Perez would have the last laugh after replacing Barry and scoring in the 84th minute for Villarreal. He scored seven goals. Only Robert Lewandowski has more in Spain's top flight. And he'll be looking to make it six straight La Liga matches with a goal against Rayo Vallecano next week. After suffering a crushing 5-1 defeat, at Barcelona, Sevilla edged their Catalan rivals Espanyol 2-0 via a first-half brace from Dori Lukbakio. 
Los Leganes subjected Celta de Vigo to their sixth defeat in nine matches, winning 3 0 via goals from Diego Garcia, Darko Brashanak, and Sergio Gonzalez. Rayo Vallecano prevailed 1 0 versus Alaves thanks to a 90th minute own goal, whilst Valencia took an early lead via Aston Villa Loni, Enzo Baranechea, only for Mauro Arambari, to level proceedings for Getafe in the 90th minute with a penalty goal. When Diego Martinez took charge of Las Palmas, they were five points away from safety after losing five of six, and they had not won a single match since February 10th. Today, they're one point away from safety after winning their first two matches under Martinez, edging Valencia 3-2 and beating Girona 1-0. Osasuna edged the Real Sociedad 2-0 via first-half goals from Lucas Toro and Ante Budimir, with Bayern Munich Loney. Brian Saragossa assisting both goals. That's now five goal contributions in his last four for the Osasuna winger. Ben, you actually wrote uh, a scouting report about Saragossa for my website, Breaking the Lines, back in January. What have you made of his progress? And overall, do you think that he has any chance of returning from El Salvador and uh, breaking into Bayern Munich's first team? Yeah, I think um, as a signing, it didn't match up with what Bayern would usually do um, and I think from a point of view of Vincent company he seems like the the type of uh, winger that he would like but at the same time physicality is everything for Bayern it always has been in terms right. of what they develop players into or what they sign players based off and I just look at that and think they might not see a long-term future. But it also depends because the the structure of the club has changed a lot recently. Um, so that, that might change how they view their recruitment. But there's definitely going to be a lot of competition. And with players like um, Florian Verts, maybe that they're heavily interested in. They've got Musiala. They've obviously brought in Elise. Um, and there's uh, some other guys coming through the academy, like Iran Kunda, that they uh, right. that they purchased recently, and then um, Adam Aznu as well. So you've got so many talents there, and I'm like, is he going to get in? And if he is, he's always going to be a squad player. So right. I think from his own point of view, it's Spain going back to Spain um, and building his career there and building his yeah. reputation back there was a great move, and maybe it's one where Bayern are looking and thinking. This, maybe this was a mistake, but send him out on loan, his value goes back up and they get a profit from, I'm sure it was next to nothing they got him for. Right. So, yeah, you're probably looking there at something that they probably saw as an opportunity and they can make a profit from. But, I, yeah, I don't see a, a long-term future from a yeah. buy -in. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, it was kind of a weird transfer. This young kid playing his first months of senior football uh, joining Bayern and then, as opposed to staying on, on loan with his team, actually went to Bayern in January where he didn't play at all under Thomas Tuchel. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I think the only purpose that served was relegating Granada. <laughs> Just like, here, we're, we're done with you, Granada. Um, but, uh, but yeah, now he's back in Spain and, and loving life at Osasuna. And as you mentioned, some really tough competition when you look at the likes of Musiala, um, uh, Olise, you know, Matthias Tell. And I think the biggest question is, how do Bayern proceed going forward, right? They've got quite a few veterans in that attack. You know, Serge Gnabry, Kingsley Coman, Thomas Müller, I believe all over the age of 30. Are they going to try to move uh, one, one of them away? Uh, but you know, overall, as you mentioned, he is a bit lightweight for Bayern. So I, I do think that potentially the move for him might be staying in Spain, going a step above uh, Osasuna, someplace like Real Betis, Real Sociedad, uh, you know, someplace like that. But overall, he is a very exciting young winger. Uh, elsewhere in Spain, Atletico de Madrid lost to Real Betis for the first time since February 2019 with an early own goal from Jose Maria Jimenez, seeing Betis move within two points of Atleti who sit one point behind Villarreal, four behind Real Madrid, and ten behind league leaders Barcelona. Atleti's crosstown rivals fared even worse than them, with Real Madrid suffering a humiliating 4 nothing defeat at the hands of Barcelona. When the ref whistled for halftime, it seemed only a matter of time before Real was going to mastermind uh, Barcelona's offside trap and open the scoring 
Ultimately, though, it was Barca who had the better go of it in the second half and demolished their rivals at the Bernabeu via goals from Rafinha, La Mina Mal, and a brace from Robert Lewandowski. Juan, this was a statement performance from the Blaugranas. How surprised were you by the result? And overall, should Carlo Ancelotti be worried about his current job security? Yeah, I don't think that... Uh... Ancelotti's job now is on the line. I think that he's going to finish the season anyway. But, you know, this was a um, magnificent uh, performance by yeah. Barcelona that Hansi Flick has something really different than Xavi. Xavi was complaining a lot about the team that he had. And Hansi Flick said, okay, this is the team that I, ha that I got. I like it. I'm not going to move... It's so much, you know, Danny Olmo was the signing of the summer. He's an amazing player, but he wasn't uh, the starting lineup. You know, he played with Fermin. He played with six guys from La Masia. So this is like real Barcelona. And this is when you have a world-class coach. Hansi Flick, uh, it was a crazy game. I'm a Barcelona supporter, uh, but and I was scared at the first half because, you know, this offside trap, doesn't uh, go usually that good, but for Barcelona it went amazing. And you know, Casado that played an amazing, amazing game. He taught Real Madrid a lesson when he found Lewandowski for the first goal. This is how you break the trap of the offside. He was uh, such a nice player, and there's this substitution that changed the game when Fermin went out and Frankie de Jong went to midfield. It was a master move because Pedri went to uh, a mostly attacking position. Frankie de Jong, that is more physical than Pedri with Casado, played an amazing second half. And for me, it wasn't a surprise. Actually, I was on TV in Mexico on Thursday, I think. And I told uh, to my colleagues, it's going to be a 3-0 for Barcelona. Well, I was short. Yeah, great result for the Catalans. They are just... Clicking on all cylinders right now in the league. Uh, and, you know, it seems like everything that Hansi Flick touches right now turns to gold. I mean, let's face it. I, I think that on paper, if you compare the two lineups, um, you know, no disrespect to the likes of Fermin Lopez and Marc Asado, but I think that's clear that Real Madrid looked a lot better on paper, at least. But, uh, yeah, ultimately... The, the, the transfer market market values and uh, you know the FIFA ratings, they don't always have a role to play in what happens on the pitch. And you know, there was this picture that uh, was uh, on social media of Madrid before the kickoff and Barcelona mm -hmm. before the kickoff. And all the Barcelona players were together, you know. Yeah. They were uh, cheering each other up. And all the players for Real Madrid, they were separated. Yeah. And I think that this shows you... A lot, you know. Hansi Flick is making a team. And it's full of youngsters. And Lewandowski that is playing amazing. I don't know what did Hansi Flick did to Robert Lewandowski. He missed two goals. But he's playing like vintage Lewandowski. And what do you think about Lamin Jamal? He's amazing. He's crazy. There's this song in Spanish that now it says, Lamin Jamal. Cada día yo te quiero yeah. más. That is, Lamin Jamal, every day I love you more. And he's maybe the biggest talent of his generation. Yeah. He's the youngest player to score at El Clásico. He's amazing. Just yeah. on, um, I was just going to say on, just on that, the thing with that photo, I think it really describes the difference between the coach of the two clubs yeah. in, and their kind of philosophy, if you like. If you think with Barcelona there's more of a an identity throughout the whole club. You know, think of the way they play. When you look at the youth teams, that Bayern game um, in the midweek, earlier in the day, I watched the UEFA Youth League and they did the exact same thing to Bayern's youth team. And the way they play, there's so many similarities. And you've got, it's not, you, you, having someone like Yamal comes around once in a generation, but you've also got Kabasi and Bernal from the same age group, which is just ridiculous. Like, And they're one of the only clubs that have consistently done that. Meanwhile, Real Madrid are more individuals. And yeah. that it just shows with that the photo that you're talking about where they're all separate and then Barcelona are all together. They're a unit, so. No, you're 100% you're correct. I, I couldn't agree more. And yeah, just 
a, a word on Lewa. I think that a lot of people sort of wrote him off last season. It was a bit of a quiet season for him, but he is showing why he still belongs in the discussion for the best center forwards in world football and why he's up there with the likes of Harry Kane and Erling Holland. And, you know, you know, he, he won the treble in his first season under Hansi Flick, uh, finished top scorer in all competitions. His second season under Flick, he broke uh, Jared Muller's, what, 50-year record for most goals in a Bundesliga season. Now it looks like he's he's on course for a big season, already 14 goals, and we're well, not even crazy. in November. That is and you know, insane. you know, one thing about Lewandowski that it's yeah. really good, also for Rafinha, you know, a lot of people were saying that they Barcelona should get rid of him. Yeah. Actually, uh, for Lewandowski, they were calling him Abuelowski. You know, it's like in Spanish, like a grandpa. Yeah. Abuelo is grandpa. So they, they were uh, saying that he's old. Yeah. But, you know, he scored two goals and he had a great game. And then the next day he was training. It was a day off and he was uh, uh, Barcelona facilities training. You know, this yeah. is like a competition beast. Lewandowski and Kansi Flick really knows how to get the best of him. Right. He's one of the best strikers of his generation, definitely. Guys, let's switch gears now to the action in France. Two months after joining from Real Salt Lake, Colombian winger Andres Gomez opened his account in European football in Le Bren to a 1-0 victory against Le Havre, whilst Angers edged Saint-Étienne 4-2 in a battle of two promoted sides. Brest stretched their unbeaten streak to five games after beating Ram 2-1 via goals from Roman Favre and Mama Balde, while Strasbourg beat not 3-1 via a goal from Dylan Bakwa in a brace from Chelsea Loney Andre Santos. That's now five goals for Andre. Only Jonathan David, Mason Greenwood, and Bradley Barcola have scored more in Ligue 1. Not a bad tally at all for a 20-year-old central midfielder who's playing for a mid-table side. Ben, the vast majority of Chelsea's lone soldiers barely taste any playing time for the first team. Does Andre have what it takes to be the exception to the rule and make a name for himself at Stamford Bridge? I think so. I think on if we're basing it on ability, I think um, and the mentality, I think he's someone who, since he was in Brazil um, at Vasco da Gama, he was he was such an important player at such a young age, right. and they were managed to fight in for, to not get relegated and there's so many times where he's just like stepped up and you know what the atmosphere is like in those leagues it's it's so hostile and in uh, Liga as well it even even more so at times so the mentality he's shown um shows that for me he's a player that long term you can trust as well and i think he's an exceptional athlete in his duels his physicality um his speed as well getting up and down the pitch and really crashing the box and being a presence there so I think when you look at Chelsea's midfield, um, at the moment, I'd say the strongest duo would be Caicedo and Lavio. Um, Enzo, it's just not it's not really working. And I right. think with how Chelsea play, I don't think it will work because they're very transition heavy. Mm. And that's, kind of, that's his big weakness, really, defending those. So you've then got someone with Santos where I'm like, he, he could at least be a squad player there. Yeah. You know? But the, the, issue with, with, the only issue with Chelsea is... Um, is that flashy enough? You know, they bought him for about ten million. Are right. they gonna? Would they rather just flip that and you know sell him for thirty, forty, and then go bring in a bigger name? Or the other side to it is, there's other players. They've also got Leslie uh, Ugochukwu at right. Southampton, who started quite well this season as well. So you know, a lot of competition Hall. there. Uh, sorry, Karen and Dewsbury Hall. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, at times I forgot that they signed him until uh, Europa League recently. Um, but yeah, he's yeah. yeah. Th there's so many players that it must be hard as a Chelsea fan to keep track of yeah. everything. You, yeah, you wouldn't need to do scouting. You just watch Strasbourg. Um, but yeah, I, I really like him, and I think he's one that I I kind of wanted to get more opportunities at Forest, and then from a Chelsea point of view, I thought he was ready. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's it's great to see him doing well out on loan as well. Yeah, can I have a word on yeah, this? Because well, I'm a commentator of the league on in Spanish and Mexico, and I followed, uh, really followed through Strasbourg. I really like the coach Liam Rossignol. For me, it's yeah. amazing. You know, he's yeah. really brave, and his team with Santos and also Nanasi, 
The street is amazing. And it's one of the youngest teams on Serie A. And one thing that I like, uh, last week, well, two weekends ago, he played against PSG and they lost. But they played the style that they usually play. You know, they didn't change the style even when they were facing the biggest team on the league. And that's really the merit of the coach. And Santos is amazing. It's a box-to-box midfielder. And if Chelsea doesn't want him, they're going to, he definitely is going to be in another big team because he's really good. He's really young, but it seems like he's been playing like for the last 10 years at top yeah, five, exactly, you know, yeah. he's really, really good. And he played solo on the midfield. This is the 4-3-3 that uh, Rossignor likes, and he's amazing. Andre Santos, yeah. I'm amazed by him. And also, Nanasi. It's right. Estrasburg, yeah. if you really want to watch like a, a fresh team with fresh ideas, this Rossignor's Strasbourg, definitely. Elsewhere in Liga, Zakaria Abukal uh, scored twice in the first eight minutes, while Josh King added a third in the 27th minute for Toulouse as Montpellier became the first team in Ligue 1 in 55 years to concede 29 goals in their opening nine matches. Lille and Lan looked headed for a goalless draw in the Derby du Nord until the 98th minute when Jonathan David scored from the penalty spot, whilst Mohamed Bayo doubled Lille's advantage shortly after. That's now five wins in six for Les Dogs. However, arguably the craziest game of the weekend took place in Lyon, when newly promoted Auger conceded a controversial penalty before the break. Manager Christophe Pellissier asked his players to leave the pitch in protest. The ref had initially called for a goal kick, only to uh, give it as a penalty against Auger. Auger captain Joubal filled out a form and made a technical reservation, something that had never happened before in Ligue 1's history, challenging the ref's decision. But after a VAR review, The penalty was given and converted by George's Mikautads. Leon Loni, Sinali Diomande would equalize after halftime for Auger, but Mikautads would restore their lead shortly after. It didn't last long, though, as Diomande set up fellow Ivorian Hamed Jr. Traore with the equalizer. Juan, this was an insane match. What did you make of this one? And overall, just why have Leon been unable to uh, rekindle that same form of last spring under Pierre Sage? You know, uh, Lyon is one of the most funny teams in Europe for me because you don't know what is going to happen. If they are on their day, they can beat anyone, but they can lose against teams that are over uh, about, uh, over the level, you know. Uh, they have players like Fofana, like Cherky, that are amazing. But uh, this weekend was crazy. I never seen something like that, you know. You just, tell it, you just said it, sorry, that this uh, coach telling his team that, okay, just leave the pitch. This wasn't a penalty kick, you know? It was crazy. But Ligon is quite interesting, and I really like Lyon. They are uh, not struggling like last year at the beginning, but they th- I think that they can play better. They played an amazing game. It was 4-3 against Strasbourg. It's, for me, so far, the best game that Ligon had this season. I, uh, I had, had the honor to be calling it. But Leon, it's it's really funny. As I told you, you don't know what's going to happen. And Pierre Sach, I think he's a really nice coach. But the problem is that they, he has these players that are really good, but they have ups and downs more frequently that they should. Big performance for uh, the Euro top scorer, Georges Mikautats, had zero goals in his first 10 Leon appearances and got himself a brace against Auger. Uh, another big performance as well from Sinali Diomand. Prior to yesterday, Diomande had scored zero goals and assists and one uh, own goal in at the Groupama for Lyon. Today he returned to his parent club and uh, he returned to his parent club and re- scored a goal and assist to lead Auger to a 2-2 draw. Not a bad result uh, for a young defender. Let's see if Diomand can continue that form. But uh, elsewhere in France, Paris Saint-Germain demolished Marseille 3-0 thanks to goals from Jean Neves and Bradley Barcola, and they find themselves three points clear of Monaco and six above Marseille and Lille. 
Despite opening the scoring, uh, courtesy of Brio and Bolo, Monaco would suffer their first defeat in all competitions since April, with Evan Gaisson equalizing before the break for Nice, and Gaetan Laborde completing the comeback win. Then, after failing to win any of their previous six matches, Nice needed a big-time result against their local rivals, and they got it in the Derby de la Côte d'Azur. Could this be just what they need to finally kick off under new manager Frank Heiss? Definitely. I think it's really saved him some time. I think it, managers can so quickly be under pressure, even when they're new. And it it's strange to me because they've... they've Nisa Club, they've changed manager a few times in a short space of time now. And Farioli was a very good coach. And obviously, he moved on. And now Frank Heise is another coach. I really liked it, what, what he did previously at Lons. So, if, But in terms of a system and how they both play, there's there's maybe some similarities, but it's very different at the same time. And you're even seeing, you know, he's trying to replicate certain roles in the last... Um, at the previous club, one of the biggest um, things was the wide centre backs, how we would use them and their role in either carrying or passing through the lines. And so he's now played Melvin Bard as the left centre back, where he previously had uh, Facundo Medina. And so you've got someone who's not actually a centre back playing there. He's playing a new role, and and there's players throughout the team where they it's a very different system as what what he's asking. So. It can take time for that to adapt and for everyone to learn that and be on board with it. So any type of results early on will be huge. Um, but I think he's a manager worth sticking with. I, I, he was a manager I, I really liked before, so I would definitely give him time. Um, and this this was against a very impressive Monaco team. I think for me, they're one of my favourite teams at the moment in terms of the recruitment they've done and what they're doing like with their youth uh, integration as well. We've got some really exciting players coming through as well. So, you know, to get a result against them is was huge for them. Yeah. Well, look, they just held uh, PSG to a stalemate at the start of the month and finally got off uh, their winless streak and beating Monaco. Doesn't get much easier for them. They're going to be facing off against Brest, Lille, and Strasbourg over the next few weeks. But, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, really good performance from, from Nice. Let's switch gears now to England. So much late drama throughout the Premier League. Erling Haaland opened the scoring in the fifth minute and grabbed his 11th league goal of the season as Manchester City edged Southampton 1-0 at the Etihad, whilst Crystal Palace picked up their first Premier League win of the season and beat Tottenham Hotspur 1-0 thanks to Jean-Philippe Mateta's opener. Fulham looked headed for a win at Goodison Park as Alex Iwobi opened the scoring against his former side. Pepeto would equalize for Everton in the 94th minute to snatch a point. Ross Barkley broke the deadlock in the 76th minute for Aston Villa, but Bournemouth would escape Birmingham with a point thanks to Evan Nielsen's uh, last-second equalizer. Over at the Amex, Danny Welbeck opened the scoring, whilst Evan Ferguson doubled Brighton's lead in the 85th minute but Ryan Aitnori would have the deficit shortly after, and Mateus Cunha leveled proceedings in the 93rd minute, denying Brighton of a third consecutive victory. Juan, after six straight defeats, Wolves have finally stopped the bleeding, but what's it going to take for them to pick up their first Premier League win since April and get back to basics under Gary O'Neill? Well, before this game, only uh, Wolverhampton and Le Havre in the French League, in the big... Uh, the European leagues were uh, having this uh, thing about so many games that they lost. They have lost uh, this weekend, but uh, Wolverhampton, they just had this uh, draw. But it's going to be hard for them, I think, to be the next season in the Premier League. It's not this, the flashy team of the last seasons. Maybe Ben has uh, more thoughts on that because he's really uh, into the Premier League. But I think that uh, Wolverhampton, the last season, they have uh, these uh, really interesting and entertaining uh, yeah. teams. This is not like the teams before. Uh, they solved a lot of players. And, well, finally, uh, after nine games, I think, two points, it's right. it's really bad for them. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah um, it's a tricky one because... 
I think with um, O'Neill, he did a great job at Bournemouth. And this season, I think the signs aren't good early on, but at the same time, they've had a really tough start in terms of the fixtures. Um, right. And there's been certain games as well. First game this season, they played Arsenal, and I thought they were actually really impressive, that game. And from that point, I was like, OK, they might do all right here because they've made some good signings. I really like Strand Larson. I think he's started really well despite the rest of the team um, not being the best. But, you know, they had a tough run of games and they've really struggled to get anything from it. I think the the relegation battle for me this season is quite hard to call because... Right. You're looking at some teams like Everton, uh, Leicester, Forest that most people would think would be down there, and actually they're looking quite solid at the moment. And they, uh, you know, Ever- from an Everton point of view, you're looking at them thinking, well, they're actually able to get a couple of wins. You know, they right. they've got there's more positive signs there. Dwight McNeil is playing in a new role, and he looks like a completely different player. I keep um, joking, call him Dwight McVale. Um, just yeah, but th- there's a and there's other players, um, sorry, the other teams as well, where Palace being further down, but on individuals, you sure you think surely they would turn it around eventually. Right. You know the players they have, and I think maybe a manager change for both of those sides might end up happening if if this continues for another month, and that might be enough to turn it around because on paper, you know, there's there's a good enough team to get out of that relegation zone. It does seem like the past two, three seasons, Wolves have kind of, like, given the rest of the competition 10 seconds of a head start. Like, they've they've fallen into an early relegation fight and just done it enough to finish, you know, comfortably mid-table, but not really make that much in the way of progress. I do think that the biggest question is going to be, where are the goals going to come from, right? You mentioned Jorgen Strand Larsen. He's looked... Fairly promising in his first Premier League campaign. Uh, Mateus Cunha, can he be a little bit more consistent in terms of the goal scoring? Uh, can Juan Hichan, you know, recreate his form from last season? That's going to be the biggest question, I think, from this Wolves side. And yeah, as you mentioned, the, the quality is there. Even though they've had to sell a lot of key players, even though they've been limited in terms of budget restraints, I do think that the, the quality is there for them to get comfortably mid-table. Um, elsewhere in England, Ryan Yates broke the deadlock early on for Nottingham Forest, but Jamie Vardy would equalize shortly after for Leicester City. Looked as if Steve Cooper was going to pick up a draw against his former employers, but Chris Wood's second half race saw Forest prevail 3-1 at the King Power Stadium. West Ham made it back-to-back home wins after edging Manchester United 2-1 vehicles from Crescencio Somerville and Jared Bowen. Whilst Chelsea overtook Brighton in the table after overpowering Newcastle, thank two one thanks to goals from Cole Palmer and Nicholas Jackson. Over in London, Ipswich found themselves two goals to the good within a half hour, but Brentford would score three straight goals in response. Liam Delop pulled level for the Tractor Boys in the 86th minute, but Brian and Buemo would complete his brace at the last second and secure a late victory for Brentford. Last but not least, Arsenal broke the deadlock within nine minutes via Bukayo Saka, but Virgil van Dijk would equalize shortly after for Liverpool. Mikel Merino restored the Gunners' advantage before halftime, and it looked like Arsenal were going to be able to hold on for a victory until the 81st minute when Mohamed Salah equalized for Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool remained four points clear of Arsenal and Aston Villa, and they have kept their unbeaten streak intact. Ben, when you consider the fact that Arsenal were missing William Saliba and Liverpool were trailing for a good portion of the match, this isn't necessarily a bad result for either side, but perhaps no team has benefited from this result more than Manchester City, who have moved one point clear of Liverpool in first place and reclaimed the top spot. What did you make of this uh, match? And overall, as an Arsenal fan, how pleased were you with your team's display? I think... This game, it definitely favoured Man City. Um, And I think from a point of view, from a Liverpool point of view, sorry, it's not, it's not a good result for them. It's, it's an okay result for Arsenal. I think considering the circumstances, when you think about, there was a point where the back line was not one of the four were in the, 
the position of the strong. It's only Ben White that would start in defence, and he doesn't start a centre back. He started right back. Um, so you've not got you've got Lewis Skelly, eighteen years old, playing against um, Salah. Then Kibio, he's been very poor recently. Ben White and Ben Party, who's a midfielder playing right back, and that was a defence that they had for the last um, ten minutes or so, and it it. To still manage to get a draw against Liverpool, considering that, is positive. Um, I think at the same time, though, like I'll, if you look before the game and you said, would you take a draw? I think no, because this is a home game and they, we've already lost too many points early this season. And you showed last season where they had a slow start to the year, um, dropped points against um, Villa and Fulham. And if both of those were wins, then that would have been enough to win the title. So, so early on, you can't afford to drop points. But generally, the performance was really positive, I think, from an Arsenal point of view. Um, I think there were moments where it's it felt like they were a lot better in Liverpool um, in terms of how the midfield were really getting um, pressing and, and not allowing any time on the ball. Uh, Marino and Rice doing a really good job of that and there's that moment from Saka, the first goal, really showed a new level he's gone up this season. I think because he's not hit the numbers of Palmer, it's not gone as much, he's not had as much ten, um, attention. But one of the things with Saka that's changed is he was always like almost too nice. And he's got a bit more about him now where he's a bit of cockiness, a bit the way he knows that he's that good now and how he's celebrating and being a bit more clinical there. And that was arguably behind Ashley Cole, one of the best left-backs the league has ever seen in Robertson. Mm. And he just, you know, not made him, spun him and made him twist up and almost injure himself or whatever, and then smacked it past the keeper. And he just, there was something about that there, similar to with Salah, where you give him a chance and he'll score. Um, and he's got a bit that of that efficiency about him as well. So there's a lot of positives to take there, but from an Arsenal point of view, Having Saliba missing, Gabriel having to be subbed off, uh, Timber as well, Calafiori missing, um, yeah. Odegaard as well. Saka wasn't match fit. It was his first game back from injury and had to come off. So there's definitely a lot of positives there. Um, but they need to start. They need to go on a win streak now because City right. will pull away if they don't win any games. Yeah, and you know I have to say I know that there was a lot of consternation in the Arsenal fan base, uh, you know, with regards to Arteta being a little too defensive. I think that was probably the case against Bournemouth, uh, showing perhaps a little too much respect for the opponents. I do think that this game against Liverpool, we saw far more aggressive uh, front foot approach from Arsenal, right? We really saw them pushing the issue, trying to put Liverpool under pressure. Wasn't good enough for a win, but I do think that there's a lot to build on. Uh, but that being said, guys, I want to thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, before we go, feel free to plug any projects that you have coming up, anything that you want to promote. Well, uh, to promote, I, I don't have, but I can tell you that if you want to uh, watch and listen uh, the Champions League or the League on in Spanish and in Mexico, you can do it in Caliente TV. That is where I work. It's been so nice uh, this season. Usually uh, we have, actually we have all the Wednesday games on the Champions League and it, in Mexico is for free, for free. And nobody, oh, nobody else has it. And also the League on and watch the League on. The League on is really, really interesting. As I told you before, watch the Strasbourg of Liam Rossignol. That is amazing. It's an amazing team. And I really like that coach, man. I think that yeah. he should be back in England really soon because he's a great, great coach. Yeah, he um, last season, I, I watched a little bit of Hull because they had um, Jacob Greaves and Jaden Philogene, who were both really good. Right. Um, and they had, they had a strange period where their whole team was like, low knees from the Premier League. They had uh, more Tyler Morton from Liverpool, Fabio Carvalho from Liverpool as well. Um, but he was re really impressive, to be honest, Liam Russell. I was surprised that they got rid of him. But then when he went to Strasbourg, yep. I was like, okay, that's a move that, from Chelsea's point of view, is great. Because this multi-club model, for me, only works if there's synergy throughout 
all the clubs. And if they're if he's playing a similar style, not exactly the same, but similar to Maresca, imagine if you're San, Andre Santos, for example, he goes out on loan, it's the same role, then he comes back and he can just copy and paste, you know? Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think he's one that they might struggle to keep hold of if he continues to do well. If, you know, if Strasbourg get into Europe or something, that would be interesting. For sure, guys. Um, yeah, really interesting to see what happens with Rosenio's development at Strasbourg. But that being said, guys, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, this was the 63rd episode of Zach Lowy's European Football Show. We've been running this show since February 2023. We've had some incredible guests uh, from all around the world. But unfortunately, the Betcoza Network has decided to discontinue their podcast network. So uh, I hate to say this, but this may very well be the last episode of Zach Lowy's European Football Show. I am looking for a new home for this podcast. Uh, so trying to find a new one. Hopefully it won't be the last but I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much to everybody who came on. Thank you so much to everyone who listened to the show. Uh, we've made some incredible memories with it. And Ben, Juan, this, if, if this was the last podcast, I want to thank you guys so much for making the time and coming on. You know, it was incredible to uh, get your insights. And yeah, thank you so much again. Man, thank it's you. been an honor. It's been an honor, and it's not going to be the last one. Trust me. Yeah. Trust me. Fingers it's not going to be the last one. You're amazing. You're terrific. And in Spanish, we said, uh, no hay mal que por bien no venga. That means that if something wrong happens for you, uh, something good is going to come. So it's, it sounds better in Spanish. But it's what I tell you. No hay mal que por bien no venga. And trust me, you're so good. And... You're going to find a new home Thank soon, you. even in Mexico. We'll see. Yeah, I, I love me, my Mexican football. I love Mexican What We'll see. But uh, yeah, Ben, any any last thoughts you want to say? Yeah, no, just the same. I think it, the thing that you've always done is just focus, like the quality is there. So when the quality is there, everything else will come eventually with, with anything. If there, It's like on... Twitter, there's some people on there who like, write some amazing stuff, but they don't have the platform. Right. And just being someone like that, where you provide a platform for those people is amazing. It can really turn around some of those people's whole career, if you like, it gives them the, the audience. So it, it, I'm sure the same will happen with this. And um, pleasure to be on here and speak to you both today. Absolutely. Guys, make sure that you check out uh, Juan. He's an incredible commentator as well. Guys, if you, you want, you know, in-depth analysis on the next big young talents in football, make sure to give Ben a follow. He's always got some really interesting threads, and I love that he's always pushing himself. Like, you never know whether he's going to be talking about a player in Brazil, Denmark, whatever. And Juan, keep providing the incredible league on coverage, all right? We need more people showing why France is not just the Farmers League, but an amazing competition. Thank you so much again. But, um, but yeah, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Like I said, hopefully it will not be the last. But if it is the last Zach Lewis European Football Show, I gave it my all, and I hope you guys appreciate it. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope to see you soon.